A hurricane bearing down on Florida in just a minute. Rob is going to have its latest track, but we begin with the terror at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Just days after classes began there, reports of an armed and dangerous suspect on campus and shots fired. This is a scene no student wants to be a part of. This video obtained by our Raleigh station WTVD. You see students waiting inside a locked lecture hall. Authorities cleared buildings one by one, leading those students away, some appearing clearly visibly distressed. Campus authorities issued this photo of the suspected gunman, a graduate student from China. And late today, officials confirmed that suspect is in custody and a member of the faculty is dead. Our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, leads us off tonight. Again in America, this time in North Carolina, police have arrested an accused gunman about a mile away from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Stage for law enforcement, possible active shoot on campus. Where police say the accused gunman shot and killed a university faculty member. Everyone was just panicking. People must open the door and they were told not to open the door. And then finally we got evacuated. We locked the doors pretty quickly and we were just kind of like hunkering down. Campus alerts went out just after 1 p.m. Eastern, telling students to shelter in place. Authorities quickly released this photo, saying if you see this person, keep your distance, put your safety first, and call 911. The same photo on the school's website says he's a grad student. Our ABC station WTVD shares this cell phone video of students taking cover on the floors of lecture halls. Frightened students recorded cell phone videos showing police clearing the building room by room. Parents with kids at a nearby grade school were in a panic. This was their first day of the school year, and the entire school district was locked down for much of the day. My heart is in my mouth. I am waiting for my kid. It was his first day at school today. He's in kindergarten, and this was the last thing that I was kind of hoping to feel on the first day of my kid's school. And the faces of those students are just heartbreaking. Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, what are police saying to the students tonight? Well, for now, Trevor, they're telling them that all your classes and events that were scheduled tonight will be canceled through tomorrow. And they're telling us that they want students to stay away from the lab where this shooting happened and where they are currently investigating. Trevor? Of course, I doubt that will be a problem. Steve Osinsami, thank you. Next to that storm headed toward Florida, Idalia is expected to make landfall as a hurricane, and tonight dozens of counties are under a state of emergency. People are rushing to get ready in Tampa Bay, buying wood to protect their windows, filling up their sandbags as well. It's one of several spots of, with areas under evacuation orders. Idalia comes as parts of Florida are still recovering from Hurricane Ian, the deadly Category 4 storm that hit the state just last year. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano has more from Tampa. Tonight, millions of families from Florida's Gulf Coast to the Carolinas racing to prepare for Idalia. In Tampa, pallets of water and other supplies flying off the shelf. Deborah LaCanza and her daughter Tori lining up for sandbags and getting ready to evacuate. Yes, I've been here 20 years and you don't wait. You just have to go. Idalia now passing through the gap between Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula, fueled by the warmest Gulf of Mexico water temps on record. If it wobbles west, you're looking at Tallahassee is going to end up getting, getting impact. If it wobbles east, you're going to see more severe impacts here in the Tampa Bay area. North of Tampa, up to 12 feet of storm surge expected. Residents in Cedar Key taking it seriously. This is cap 3 now. With 105 cold temperature and be a 5 by the time it hits us. Idalia is set to be the first major hurricane to impact Florida since monster Category 4 Ian made landfall last September. With winds of 150 miles an hour, it decimated barrier islands and killed at least 150 people. Of course, we remember Ian well. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, as Florida is preparing now for this storm to arrive, I know you're tracking the latest on his path. Walk us through it. All right, Trevor, well, it continues to gather or in organization and forward speed in this direction. So hurricane warnings now continue to be expanded from Sarasota south of Tampa all the way up through the Big Bend towards Apalachicola and points inland like Tallahassee and Gainesville. Uh, Gainesville could really get hurt with this. All right, right now off the western tip of Cuba, there you see it no eye yet, but it certainly will get one, I think, as we go into the next 24 hours. It gets into the Gulf of Mexico. That's where we expect it to rapidly intensify because of those warm waters in a favorable environment to Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3 quickly by Wednesday morning and then Wednesday late morning sometime making landfall around Cedar Key, give or take 100 miles into Savannah as a strong tropical storm. Charleston getting some of this action as well. Wind, rain, and of course that storm surge very 
susceptible to it here in the eastern Gulf, up to 12 feet in some spots. Tampa could see seven feet or more, and because of that, evacs have started here. Hurricane Franklin, meanwhile, is a beast of a Category 4. Look at that eye. My goodness, 145 mile an hour winds. This one will miss Bermuda, but maybe gets a Cat 5 strength, and it's uh, it already bringing life-threatening rip currents and high surf to the east coast. That will continue for the next couple days. Meanwhile, here in Florida, the urgency to prepare is certainly ramping up tonight. Trevor? And we already have several teams getting ready for what could happen. Rob Marciano for us tonight. Rob, thank you. And next to new details about the deadly shooting in Jacksonville, Florida. Tonight, the FBI is investigating this as a hate crime as we get a look at new surveillance video from the Dollar General where a 21-year-old white man killed three black people. And we're also going to hear the desperate 911 call in part from the shooter's family that was made to police. ABC's Alex Prochet is in Jacksonville with those details. Tonight, new details in that racially motivated shooting at a Dollar General that left three black people dead. We have discovered new uh, facts regarding the shooter's movements and whereabouts hours and minutes before he committed his acts of senseless violence at Dollar General. Late today, law enforcement sharing this video they say shows the suspect, 21-year-old Ryan Christopher Palmetter, first entering a family dollar store about a mile away. Not only did the shooter park at the family dollar, he also went inside his store and bought some items. He then stopped at Edward Waters University a historically black university down the street. This video being used in the investigation, showing the suspect donning a tactical vest and blue latex gloves. Students flagging down a security guard. What's going through your mind? That there's something wrong. Um, I was not able to see a weapon at that time. Um, however, I did see what appeared to be a tactical vest, a mask along with a hat covering his head at that time. Authorities say the suspect hopped a curve and fled, driving to this Dollar General store where he began an 11 minute rampage. Surveillance video shows the shooter without warning, firing 11 rounds into 52 year old Angela Michelle Carr's Kia, killing her. He then walks into the store armed with a handgun and an AR-15 style rifle that authorities say he bought legally. The suspect shooting 19 year old employee AJ Laguerre Jr. Multiple witnesses fleeing out the back of the store and then later 29 year old Gerald Galleon enters. The shooter killing him, missing his girlfriend. And 10 minutes into this heinous act, he sends a text. The suspect texts his father and says, use a screwdriver to get into my room. The father enters the room and finds a last will and testament of the suspect along with a suicide note on his laptop. ABC News obtaining this distressed 911 call his father made to police. He left in his car a couple of hours ago. His father stating that his son had been suicidal before and was receiving psychiatric help, but had stopped taking medication. All right, and does your son go anywhere that you know of? Is there like common place no. he goes to? No, he doesn't go anywhere. By that time, the rampage was already over. The shooter taking his own life as officers arrived on the scene. Investigators finding writings on the gunman, which they say contained racist and hateful ideology, as well as painted swastikas on one of the firearms. Plainly put, this shooting was racially motivated and he hated black people. The FBI opening domestic terror and federal hate crime investigations, saying there's also evidence that the suspect harbored anti-LGBTQ plus and anti-Semitic grievances. The latest federal data shows a 12% increase in hate crime incidents. At a vigil Sunday, Governor Ron DeSantis, who assigned laws to restrict how race is taught in Florida public schools, was booed. The governor condemning the shooting. We are not going to let people be targeted based on their race. President Biden asked about the shooting just before meeting with Dr. King's family members and other civil rights leaders at the White House. We can't let hate prevail. Tonight, family members of the victims praying that their loved ones spark change. I hope that this really does spark something for people to take a stand. Haunting to see those videos of the suspect knowing what would occur later in that day. Alex joins us now from Jacksonville. Alex, what are you learning about the shooter's background? Well, Trevor, the Sheriff's Department says it's still investigating, but that that shooter worked at a Dollar Tree from October of 2021 to July of 2022. They also say that he had no prior criminal history. Trevor. All right, Alex Perche, thank you. 
Now tonight to several developments in the criminal cases against former President Trump. A judge has set March 4th of next year as the date for the federal trial on election interference charges. That is the day before Super Tuesday, and Trump has already said he will appeal that date. Separately, his former chief of staff and co-defendant in Georgia's election racketeering case, Mark Meadows, he took the stand for hours today trying to get that case moved to federal court. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is in Atlanta for us covering it all. Tonight, a federal judge in Washington setting a date for Donald Trump's trial on charges he tried to overturn the 2020 election, March 4th, just one day before Super Tuesday, smack in the middle of the presidential campaign. Special counsel Jack Smith in court for the decision. The former president had asked to push this trial off more than two years to April 2026. His lawyers arguing any sooner would amount to a show trial and a miscarriage of justice. In a heated hearing, they pointed to reams of documents to review and the pressures of the campaign. Judge Tanya Chutkin ordering Trump's lawyers to take the temperature down. Prosecutors argued Trump's own behavior on a near daily basis, including his posts on social media, requires a speedy trial, saying he has publicly disparaged witnesses, he has attacked the integrity of the courts, the citizens of the District of Columbia who make up our jury pool, and this potentially prejudices the jury pool. The judge seeming to agree, saying Mr. Trump, like any defendant, will have to make the trial date work regardless of his schedule. There is a societal interest to a speedy trial. At the same time in Georgia, another key hearing underway. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis charging Trump and 18 others with conspiring to overturn the election in that state. How are you feeling today, Mr. Meadows? Today, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows asking a judge to move his case to federal court where he thinks he can get a more sympathetic jury. Meadows, who has been largely silent for months, taking the stand for more than three hours, insisting, I don't know that I did anything that was outside the scope of my role as Chief of Staff, including arranging that phone call where Trump pressured Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Mr. President, everybody is on the line, and just so this is Mark Meadows, the Chief of Staff, on that call, Trump pushing Raffensperger to find the votes he needed. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Meadows testifying that everything he did was in his capacity as a top White House aide. I saw it as part of my role, he said. The president gave clear direction to deal with it. But prosecutors pushing him. How come he was the only White House official on that call? Why were none of the White House lawyers involved? And late today, Raffensperger himself taking the stand, saying flat out, I thought that it was a campaign call. Trevor Court ended here with no immediate ruling from the judge. Meadows is hoping for an answer before he and Trump and the other defendants in this case need to return here to Fulton County for their arraignments. Today, the judge set those for September 6th, and it's expected cameras will be allowed in court. Trevor? Aaron Katursky for us. Aaron, thank you. And let's stick with politics here. We have ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper joining me now for a closer look at the former president's legal challenges. We know that there are several, but let's just focus on this first one, that March 4th trial date, of course, the day before Super Tuesday. If that date does stick, what kind of chaos are we looking at with that calendar? Well, Super Tuesday is a time when you have all of the opponents, all of the candidates who are going to be out uh, campaigning. They are trying to make last-minute appeals uh, to all those voters because the name of the game at that point is turnout. What happens uh, and who is the GOP nominee could be determined from the outcome of Super Tuesday. And so you're going to have all of these candidates who are going to be making their last-minute appeals to voters across the country. Uh, and that's going to be a critical time. And former President Trump is likely not going to be out on the trail. Uh, and we know that his opponent's going to be looking to take advantage of that. Maybe the single most important day of the primary itself. Uh, of course, this is just one case. He's got four of them that he's facing. That's a single day ahead of Super Tuesday. Obviously, that one day would be very important. But with all of these cases and the appeals and the potential trials, I mean, what is the former president's calendar going to look like as he tries to juggle the campaign? It is going to be a collision course when you look at his legal calendar. And uh, the civil trial for Trump's defamation case with E. Jean Carroll, that is happening at the same time, the same day as the Iowa caucus. That's January 15th. Uh, shortly after that, you're going to have Super Tuesday. After Super Tuesday, uh, you're going to see the uh, 
New York case, that hush money case uh, with Alvin Bragg here in New York City, that could begin. Uh, May 20th, we're going to see the federal criminal trial in the classified documents case. And this is all happening smack dab in the middle of a busy primary season. Uh, we Earlier in the show already, we talked about that racist shooting in Jacksonville. Another candidate, Governor Ron DeSantis, he's returned to Florida there in the aftermath. Of course, in the response, though, it is also drumming up maybe some uh, contentiousness from opponents or people that don't support the governor about some of his policies in Florida. Can you kind of walk us through that? Right. When he went to that vigil in Jacksonville, he was booed. Uh, and there were even folks who were saying that uh, the governor has blood on his hands. And, and part of it is that you have to remember uh, that Governor DeSantis has declared Florida the place where, quote unquote, wokeism goes to die. And wokeism has really been shorthand for uh, things about diversity efforts, conversations about race. Uh, lessons about black history. Uh, and so uh, we have to remember that all of this is not happening in a vacuum. And so there are folks for whom that is not lost on, uh, and they are pointing to that. Today. And in, in that vein, speaking more largely about race, another candidate who saw a pretty prominent bump after the first debate, Vivek Ramaswamy. Before this shooting happened on Friday, he was at a campaign event in Iowa and made some comments about white supremacy. Let's play a little clip from that. I've spoken to grassroots conservative audiences across this country and across this state. I've never once encountered that yet. I'm sure the I'm sure the boogeyman white supremacist exists somewhere in America. I've just never met him. <laughs> never seen one. <laughs> never met one in my life, right? Maybe I'll meet a uh, maybe I'll meet a unicorn sooner. Now to be clear, he said that before the shooting in Jacksonville, but since then he's still doubling down. Right. Uh, he has said that he is uh, doubling down on those comments. He has not only not explicitly admitted that uh, white supremacy exists, uh, but he's also made other comments. He likened a, a sitting black congresswoman and a, a black author to uh, grand wizards of the KKK. Uh, and uh, he is someone that has said lots of things that are inflammatory on the campaign trail about race. Uh, the bottom line is that it's likely not going to hurt him when it comes to GOP primary voters. Uh, but down the line, should he become the GOP nominee? And that's a long way away. Right. Uh, but it could hurt him if those words come back to haunt. Right. What plays with the base? And then you can worry about what plays with the larger country maybe beyond that. But very fascinating to watch this all play out. Avery Harper, thanks so much. Always great to talk to you. Thank you. And we want to head back to Florida now in the tragic rescue helicopter crash. Broward County specifically, the disturbing video showing what so many people saw from the ground. ABC's Victor Okendo is in Pompano Beach for us tonight. Tonight, the terrifying moment. This helicopter spiraling, then crashing in South Florida, killing two people. Out on an emergency call just before 9 a.m., watch the Broward Sheriff's Office fire rescue chopper flying with flames and smoke trailing behind. A pilot calling for help. We just had an engine failure. Uh, we're going to require priority for a runway, please. We're declaring an emergency. Suddenly, the tail breaks midair, sending it spinning out of control and plunging into an apartment building, sparking this massive inferno and leaving a gaping hole. It sounded like a bomb. An explosion went off. Two of the three crew members on board that chopper survived. He got out? Yeah, he got out. Oh. Dramatic video showing them crawling on the roof near the burning wreckage. But authorities say a woman inside that building and Captain Terryson Jackson, who was on board that chopper, were killed. He was trapped, could not get out, and we lost him. Jackson had been with the department for 19 years. In this video, speaking about his call to serve. If someone is in the back of my unit, they're having possibly one of the worst days of their life. And it just helps me sleep better at night knowing that during that time I could be there for them. Tonight, Captain Jackson remembered. He was one of the best of us, one of the brightest. The type of effort and commitment he had for this community, impeccable. And Victor Okendo joins us now from Florida, actually at the site of this uh, crash landing there. Victor, take us through what you're seeing there and also where's the federal investigation stand here into this crash? Trevor, this crash site, just half a mile from the runway that they were trying to reach. The two crew members who survived and two people on the ground, they were transported to the hospital. And tonight, the NTSB and FAA are investigating. Trevor? All right, Victor, thank you.
Next tonight, as lawsuits begin to mount in the Lahaina wildfire disaster, the investigation into the cause of those fires continues, and questions about the potential mishandling of evidence are also ramping up. Residents who live in the area have said they saw small fires sparked by downed power lines starting as early as 6.30 the morning of the fire. Residents also claim they saw crews cleaning up downed power lines in the days following the fire, but several days prior to federal investigators' arrival to determine a cause. That's potentially removing critical evidence from the scene, which would be a violation of national guidelines. ABC News reached out to Hawaiian Electric for comment and some clarity on when exactly their crews began clearing down power lines that would have been part of the ATF investigation. We received no response so far. Another investigation is also underway after a U.S. military aircraft carrying 23 Marines crashed on a North Australian island, killing three. Late today, those three Marines were identified. They include 21-year-old Corporal Spencer Collard of Arlington, Virginia, 29-year-old Captain Eleanor LeBeau of Belleville, Illinois, and 37-year-old Major Tobin Lewis of Jefferson, Colorado. The Osprey was conducting a training exercise when it went down on Melville Island. Air traffic control audio captured U.S. personnel in a second aircraft radio in an emergency call for help. At least three Marines who survived the crash remain hospitalized. The cause of the crash has not been identified. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime, including the new study that takes a closer look at the role that CTE could play in the deaths of young athletes. Researchers have discovered. But next, an early southern swing to two states that could play a pivotal role in 2024. Can President Biden and the Democrats hold on to Georgia? And does South Carolina only have eyes for Donald Trump? Is there anything that would turn you against Donald Trump? There are probably many things that could. I just haven't seen any evidence of anything that um, will do so up to this particular point. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Last week, former President Donald Trump's closest Republican rivals took the stage for the first debate of the election season without him in attendance. And just a day later, he surrendered on charges in Georgia, resulting in the first mugshot of an American president. But none of this appears to be putting a dent in his commanding lead in the Republican polls. Can anything change that? ABC's global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz spoke to voters in Georgia and South Carolina. It's the state that turned the tide for Joe Biden in the 2020 primary. Thank you, South Carolina! But delivered its general election votes to Donald Trump. 
Three years later, the reliably red state remains firmly in the grasp of the former president, despite indictments, impeachments, and an insurrection. Maurice Washington, former Republican chair of Charleston County and former supporter of Barack Obama, is now behind Donald Trump. Is there anything that would turn you against Donald Trump? There are probably many things that could. I just haven't seen any evidence of anything that um, will do so up to this particular point. Trump is polling 34 points above his nearest rival statewide and far above the two South Carolinians in the race, Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, leaving many to believe a Trump-Biden redo is a near certainty. I think it's going to be an unprecedented historic for reasons that are good, bad, and ugly next year. Despite the strong showing, Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace, who criticized Trump for January 6th, sees her constituents looking for an alternative. I think people, some people are, are disenchanted with things in the past. Donald Trump. Uh, yeah, of course. And on the leafy campus of the College of Charleston, Politics professor Gibbs Knotts says she may be right. I think Donald Trump is proven to be a pretty good primary candidate, but I think he's going to be a less good general election candidate. I think there are a lot of people in the Republican primary who are better positioned to win the general election in those swing states. Democratic Congressman Jim Clyburn, who many credit with delivering South Carolina for Biden, is hopeful Trump won't be the nominee, but is concentrating his efforts on the general election. Can Joe Biden reinvigorate all the voters he had in 2020, who may be disappointed in some parts of his administration? I think he can, and I think he will. It's not just Joe Biden that has to do this. We've got to do this. Black and white, young and old, rich and poor, male and female. But few states will be as key to winning 2024 than neighboring Georgia, which helped send President Biden to the White House and Donald Trump to the Fulton County Jail this week. Georgia, of course, is where Donald Trump is in legal trouble. It's here where he asked the Secretary of State to find 11,000 or more votes. But Donald Trump could also be in political trouble here. Patricia Murphy, a political columnist for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, says that political trouble was evident long before 2020. Large neighborhoods in suburban Atlanta where we used to see tons of Trump signs had nothing. And Joe Biden came into Georgia and just offered a quieter, um, more moderate solution. And Georgia voters have moved more moderate. Biden's win in Georgia was fueled in part by a shift in suburban voters and growing minority populations in the metro Atlanta area. Voters Democrats will rely on heading to the ballot box. Cliff Albright, co-founder and executive director of Black Voters Matter, is confident black voters will turn out once again for Biden. I was down here in 2020 and, and talking to black voters. They were enthused to come out. Do you feel that this time? I know it's early, but do you feel that? Honestly, I really do. And we believe that the closer that we get to 24, the, the more that people are going to be energized. But the truth is, we've been energized really ever since 2018 and, and 2020. But with Democrats worried about Biden's age and Republicans and making the most of it, Democratic support in Georgia is no guarantee. I think Joe Biden is helping Donald Trump a little bit right now. Joe Biden is seen right now as a depreciating asset. As he continues to have stumbles on the campaign trail, literal and figurative, as Kamala Harris really fails to sort of ignite Georgia voters' imaginations, that's just a slightly weaker ticket than it used to be in 2020. At the same time, what has Donald Trump done to gain a single vote in Georgia? But what about that debate? We joined a group of young Republicans from Cobb County that night, a watch party, they called it, although not everyone was watching. Brittany Ellison was taking a harder look at new candidates. But in the end, for her, one thing is certain. Are you still considering Donald Trump? If he is the Republican nominee, I will absolutely vote for him. 
Our thanks, as always, to Martha Raddatz, and we still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, is there something in the water? The mystery hunters are out in Scotland as the search for the Loch Ness Monster goes high-tech. So were there any signs of Nessie? But next, 19 defendants, including one former president of the United States, and a mugshot that's already been worth millions. We'll take a closer look at the election interference case in Fulton County by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome to Generation Gap. Thursdays. What is secretariat? A secretary? That's a woman? <laughs> Kelly Ripa hosts the comedy game show where nobody acts their age. <laughs> Juniors and seniors work together to flex their pop culture knowledge for big prizes and bigger fun. Who is this Mr.? Mr. Rockstar? Mr. T is going to be very upset with all of us. Generation Gap, Thursdays on ABC and stream on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Next week, former President Trump and his co-defendants will be arraigned on charges in the Georgia election interference case. Today, the judge set the date for September 6th, wasting no time after the former president's historic surrender. And here's a closer look by the numbers. All 19 defendants, including Trump, turned themselves in before the Friday deadline. And authorities, of course, released their mug shots. You have seen them. A lot of different choices between whether or not to smile or whether to keep it stern. Trump and his co-defendants face 41 different charges 
charges, including racketeering, with prosecutors listing 161 overt acts to allegedly try to overturn the 2020 election results in Georgia. Now, 18 of the defendants had pre-negotiated bond agreements with Trump's $200,000 bond set as the highest of the group. Rudy Giuliani was second in that category at $150,000. Now, Trump was listed at six foot three, 215 pounds at processing as inmate number P01135809. And he was so eager to share his mugshot that he posted it to X, formerly Twitter, for the first time in 958 days. And he linked to a website encouraging people to donate money. He says his campaign and his campaign says that supporters pitched in $7.1 million within 48 hours of his Georgia surrender. So, what's next from here? Well, four defendants are trying to move their cases to federal court. That includes former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, whose hearing on that request began today. And then there is those 30 unnamed, unindicted co-conspirators, and the question of whether any of them or any of Trump's co-defendants will decide to cooperate. The prosecutor, Fawny Willis, is asking for a trial date no later than October 23rd, which is exactly eight weeks from today. We still have much more ahead here on Prime coming up. Quarterback Eli Manning and coach Tom Coughlin helped the New York Giants win two Super Bowls. We're going to see how the pair is now teaming up again to achieve a different goal of tackling childhood cancer. But next, trapped on the tarmac, the record fine announced today that American Airlines is facing for making passengers wait. First up, though, we'll look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. An eye-opening new study about CTE in athletes, the biggest airline fine ever for keeping passengers on the tarmac, and Simone Biles sticks the landing once again. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. A new study released by Boston University found the degenerative brain disease, CTE, is in 40% of athletes who died before the age of 30. The study examined 152 donated brains and found the disease primarily affected football players. In a larger survey of other donated brains, fewer than 1% of the general population was found to have CTE. Mexican food chain Chipotle will pay $322,000 to settle allegations it broke Washington, D.C. child labor laws. A district investigation found Chipotle workers under 18 years old worked after 10 p.m. and beyond the maximum hours and days per week allowed in the district. Is there something out there? This morning, dozens are gathered for the biggest hunt for the Loch Ness Monster in 50 years. The search for a creature has been ongoing for decades, fueled by this famous 1934 photo, later revealed to be a hoax. This time, searchers using infrared drones and a hydrophone to map sounds in the lake. I think there's something there, whether it's a, a giant eel or whatever, I, I think there's something down there. One of the country's biggest airlines has been handed the biggest fine ever for keeping passengers waiting on the tarmac for too long. American Airlines is being handed $4.1 million in fines from the Department of Transportation for 43 flights between 2018 and 2021 that were stuck on tarmacs for hours without giving passengers a chance to get off. Over 5,000 passengers were impacted on those flights. American says it was a very small number out of all of its flights over those years and the most were due to bad weather in Dallas. Legendary singer-songwriter Elton John was briefly hospitalized after a fall at his villa in France yesterday. Representatives for the artist say the 76-year-old is back at home and in good health. He recently wrapped up his farewell Yellow Brick Road World Tour in Stockholm. John played for more than 6 million fans since the tour began in September of 2018. And Simone Biles is still on top of the gymnastics world, becoming the only gymnast to win the U.S. All-Around Championship for the eighth time this weekend. The 26-year-old started competing 10 years ago as a teenager and has set multiple records in the sport. She will compete at the World Championships in Belgium this fall. For more than a decade, the dynamic duo of Eli Manning and his coach Tom Coughlin led the New York Giants, winning two Super Bowls along the way. And now the former coach and QB are teaming up again off the field for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. We had a chance to visit them at the Giants facility and hear more about their plans to fight childhood cancer. Good to see you again. Thank you. Welcome back to East Rutherford. <laughs> For Tom Coughlin and Eli Manning, returning to the New York Giants practice facility is always special. It's been almost 20 years now since you were hired as head coach. How do we feel walking back in the building? 20 years? Come on. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> the two joined forces as head coach and quarterback in 2004, spending 12 seasons together. The Giants have won the Super Bowl. Those 12 seasons resulting in two Super Bowl titles and countless memories along the way. The memories just come pouring back. Yeah. You get the urge to start barking out orders at Eli at all? <laughs> I, was, I was late to this interview. He's, already, he's kind of giving me the look at it. Like, look, hey, five minutes it. early. But on this day, it's not about football. Just wherever you like. Where were you going to be? Two different charities, but working together. It's all about awareness. It's all about letting people know what these families go through when they hear those incredible words, your child has cancer. September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, highlighting cancers affecting those 19 years old and under. And while cancer in children and adolescents is rare, according to the CDC, it's one of the leading causes of death by disease for children in the U.S. Ahead of the upcoming Awareness Month, the Giants legends are filming this video. In life, it takes a team to get through the tough stuff. That's why this September, in support of all those families who have a child with cancer and those who've lost a child to this disease, we want you 
to show us your team. The theme is all about teamwork, a campaign urging viewers to take a selfie with people they lean on and post it with the hashtag, show us your team. Smile, coach. One, two, three. When you have cancer, you're not going through it alone, and, and you're not going to beat it alone. You're going to need a team of support from your family, your friends, your community, your nurses and doctors in the hospital. That's why Coach and I are, are forming our own team, and we're getting together, and it's about, you know, saying thank you to those people that are helping you. Since 2015, Manning has partnered with Hackensack Meridian Health in New Jersey for the initiative Tackle Kids Cancer, which raises money for pediatric cancer research and patient care programs. He represented them on the field during the NFL's My Cause, My Cleats campaign and last year on ESPN's Manning Cast. Uh, my Cleats are supporting Tackle Kids Cancer, which does uh, research for pediatric cancer at Hackensack Meridian Health here in New Jersey. Eli's work with them in part helped him earn the NFL's Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for the 2016-2017 season. It started with going to visit children in the hospital, try to lift their spirits, and it just became, well, what else can I do? How else can I be helpful? How can I make a bigger impact? And now, you know, eight years later, I've raised over $20 million. And as for what spurred him to get involved, he credits the man next to him. When I first got to the New York Giants, you saw and you know his passion for, for football, but we also saw his passion uh, for giving back. Like any strong team, Manning and Coughlin's organizations attack the cause with different skill sets. While Tackle Kids Cancer focuses on research, Coughlin's J Fund works on supporting families mainly through financial help. A form of medication may cost a family over $200,000 in one year, okay? And you think about 87% uh, of families uh, find that their income is depleted. The J of the J Fund refers to Jay McGillis, a former defensive back who played for Coughlin at Boston College and passed away in 1992 after a battle with leukemia. At that point in time, having gone through it with his family, I knew if I ever had a chance to give back, this was how I would give back. 31 years later, do you still think about Jay while you're doing this work? I do. As for motivation now, Coughlin and Manning need look no further than the patients and families they visit, including Camilla. Wonderful to meet you. Yeah. It's hard to not get really, really attached to these kids. They're just little guys going through something that, God forbid, you wouldn't want anybody to go through. And both Eli and Coach also know making a difference can take many forms, including just showing up. There was a little boy who was very close to death. And he couldn't come that day because he was in the hospital. The father comes in with the, with the little boy about 5.30, quarter, 6. Eli's already gone home. I call Eli. He comes back. He spends time with the little boy and his dad. About a week later, the little guy passed away. And his dad said that that was the greatest thing that ever happened to that little boy, was spending a half an hour with Eli Manning. Mm -hmm. You remember that? I remember it. Remember it well. And uh, you, you feel for, obviously, the kid. You feel for the families, the parents. And I know how I, how I feel when, my, when one of my kids has, has the flu, uh, let alone cancer. And you want to do anything to help them. Of course, coach and quarterback did find some fun moments together during the shoot. And share it on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Coach, you've heard of those. Wise guy. Who do you think is better delivering jokes off the teleprompter, you or Eli? <laughs> no doubt, right here. Wait, you know what a hashtag is? What a what is? Exactly. Through that humor, a large platform, and a selfie to wrap it up. One, two, three. Eli and Coach hope their teamwork will help get help to those who need it. To be able to team up with Coach again and, and help uh, two of our charities that are so important to us that are dealing with cancer is awesome. I think we'll be able to have a big impact, raise a lot of awareness, and continue to help more families that are dealing with cancer. And our thanks to Eli and Coach for spending some time with me, getting to share that story, and Camilla, too, a wonderful little girl that I got to spend some time with. Uh, also today, much more news. Today marks 60 years since the March on Washington, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his historic I Have a Dream speech. It was, of course, one of the most significant events of the 20th century. It became a defining moment for modern-day civil rights. Here's GMA3 anchor DeMarco Morgan. On that sweltering summer day in 1963, more than a quarter million people gathered near the Lincoln Memorial. People just came from all over. 
It was a major happening in American politics. When my mom and dad woke up um, and they looked out the window at, at, uh, from the Willard, uh, they were a little bit concerned. They didn't see many people on the streets. At that time, they were just hoping for 50,000. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Protest songs filled the air. A parade of speakers from John Lewis to A. Philip Randolph worked to invigorate the crowd. I have the pleasure to present to this great audience young John Lewis, national chairman, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. My friends, let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the now iconic I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King started out with a very boring speech because somebody had written it for him. And it, it, was, it was good speech, it was sound politics. Uh, but then the spirit hit, and, and Mahalia Jackson said, yeah. Tell them about your dream. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? The march and that speech playing a pivotal role in shaping the course of civil rights in America. There really has not been one movement since the 60s that the civil rights movement did not influence um, on some level. Decades later, civil rights leaders are back here again to mark the 60th anniversary of that speech and a march that changed the world. You know, Daddy was a... Uh, an expert at how to use the King's English in speaking the truth. I mean, he was very surgical. Daddy had the, the, the healing balm in his tongue. The organizers saying this is a continuation, not a commemoration of Dr. King's work. Dr. King just didn't see what was wrong and, and said, okay, that was nice and talked about it. He actually was a man of action and did something about it. And that's what we're hoping to encourage Americans to continue to do. Bringing together global civil rights leaders. The focus of this weekend is to bring together two over 200 organizations where we all have something in common. Every last, or many of us came over here in different boats but we're now all in the same boat together. With a focus on the next generation as well. It's very important for every generation to play a part. No movement for social change in this world has happened or been effective without the involvement of young people. Dr. King urged us to struggle against the triple evils of racism, poverty, and bigotry. Our daughter, um, Yolanda Renee King, is the only grandchild of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King at 15 years old. We need the vision uh, and energy of young people to help move this country forward. My mother said something critical. She said, struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. Thanks to DeMarco Morgan for that. And finally tonight, the remarkable story of Cheryl White, who made history in 1971 as America's first black woman jockey at just 17 years old. Her extraordinary life is now at the center of a new novel called The Jockey and Her Horse. Good Morning America's Robin Roberts has the story. She was the definition of a trailblazer, but you probably never heard her name. There was a time that she was a household name. She was viral before we knew what viral was. <laughs> Everywhere I went as a kid, everybody knew who Cheryl White was. In 1971, Cheryl White galloped into the world of horse racing and conquered the feat of becoming the first ever African-American woman jockey at just 17 years old. The grandstands were full, and on her shoulders was the idea, if she wins, it means women are equal. It means black people have a place in this sport. If she doesn't, and these are headlines, if she doesn't, it means the opposite. And this is what a 17-year-old girl was carrying with her in the saddle. The daughter of a famous horse trainer, Cheryl had been honing her skills since she was old enough to ride. 
And her brother Raymond says she could race with the best of them. What were the qualities about her that made her such a great jockey? You know, they say a jo good jockey should be, their back should be flat. You could put a cup of coffee on it. <laughs> and, um, and her form was perfect. Over the next two decades, she kept making history of her own, winning 750 races and several coveted awards. How do you think that we don't know that your sister is not more well known? My sister wasn't a great self promoter. She was the type that just wanted to ride. She wanted to be left alone. She did not brag about herself. I was the bragger <laughs> in effect. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the events of Cheryl's extraordinary life inspiring the new young adult novel, The Jockey and Her Horse, written by author and New York Times reporter Sarah Maslin Neer and Cheryl's beloved brother, Raymond White Jr. How'd this happen? Sarah contacted me through email back in 2021 and uh, said she bought a copy of Jet Magazine and the original copy my sister was on and was a very self-proclaimed fangirl of Cheryl White. She was a Serena and Venus Williams of her time, mm -hmm. and she has been erased from history. The book is told from multiple perspectives, even at times through the eyes of Cheryl's horse. Every detail in the book, every race Cheryl ran, every setback is completely in keeping with her history. The part that's a narrative fiction, a, a fanciful idea, is that our Cheryl goes on a journey and discovers that she's not singular, that she is part of a long legacy and a race legacy of black contribution to thoroughbred racing. You called your sister a true American legend. Yes. She was just a pioneer. I mean, she, at 17, during the turbulence that we had going on in the early 70s, she was amazing to go through everything she went through fighting for the right to ride and wanting to ride. Raymond says he hopes the book inspires the next generation to ride toward their own finish line, whatever that may be. Well, the book is not just to inspire children to be jockeys or ride horses, but to inspire them to be anything they want to be, from an astronaut to a senator, a teacher, whatever you want to be, inspire to be, you can do that. And thanks so much to Robin Roberts for that report. That is our show for this hour. I'm Trevor Alt in for Lindsay Davis. You can stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great night. And coming up in the next hour, the Spanish soccer executive embroiled in controversy for what he did to one of the players after she helped win the World Cup. And abandoning their homes and living at a local gym instead, the dangers leading these families to flee from their neighborhoods. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. 
Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings, the full series. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis, and this is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the latest developments at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill after a shooting on campus just days into the school year. Plus, the judge sets the trial date in the January 6th case against former President Trump, how it could have major implications for his 2024 campaign. And tonight, it's being called Spain's Me Too movement, the new fallout from that unwanted kiss after the Spanish women's soccer team captured the World Cup. But we begin with that storm headed toward Florida. Idalia is expected to make landfall as a hurricane, and tonight dozens of counties are under a state of emergency. The storm's already lashing parts of Cuba tonight, and all of this comes as parts of Florida are still recovering from the deadly Hurricane Ian, Category 4 storm that hit the state last year. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano has more from Tampa. Tonight, millions of families from Florida's Gulf Coast to the Carolinas racing to prepare for Idalia. In Tampa, pallets of water and other supplies flying off the shelf. Deborah Lacanza and her daughter Tori lining up for sandbags and getting ready to evacuate. Yes, I've been here 20 years and you don't wait. You just have to go. Idalia now passing through the gap between Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula, fueled by the warmest Gulf of Mexico water temps on record. If it wobbles west, you're looking at Tallahassee is going to end up getting, getting impact. If it wobbles east, you're going to see more severe impacts here in the Tampa Bay area. North of Tampa, up to 12 feet of storm surge expected. Residents in Cedar Key taking it seriously. It says cap three now with 105 cold temperature and being five by the time it hits us. Idalia is set to be the first major hurricane to impact Florida since monster Category 4 Ian made landfall last September. With winds of 150 miles an hour, it decimated barrier islands and killed at least 150 people. Of course, we remember Ian Wells, senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, as Florida is preparing now for this storm to arrive, I know you're tracking the latest on his path. Walk us through it. All right, Trevor, well, it continues to gather in organization and forward speed in this direction. So hurricane warnings now continue to be expanded from Sarasota south of Tampa all the way up through the Big Bend to, towards Apalachicola and points inland like Tallahassee and Gainesville. Uh, Gainesville could really get hurt with this. All right, right now off the western tip of Cuba, there you see it no eye yet, but it certainly will get one, I think, as we go into the next 24 hours. It gets into the Gulf of Mexico. That's where we expect it to rapidly intensify because of those warm waters in a favorable environment to Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3 quickly by Wednesday morning and then Wednesday late morning sometime, making landfall around Cedar Key, give or take 100 miles, into Savannah as a strong tropical storm. Charleston getting some of this action as well. Wind, rain, and, of course, that storm surge very susceptible to it here in the eastern Gulf, up to 12 feet in some spots. Tampa could see seven feet or more, and because of that, evacs have started here. Hurricane Franklin, meanwhile, is a beast of a Category 4. Look at that eye. My goodness, 145 mile an hour winds. This one will miss Bermuda, but maybe get to Cat 5 strength, and it's uh, it was already bringing life-threatening rip currents and high surf to the east coast. That will continue for the next couple of days. Meanwhile, here in Florida, the urgency to prepare is certainly ramping up tonight. Trevor? And we already have several teams getting ready for what could happen. Rob Marciano for us tonight. Rob, thank you. 
Next to the terror at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, just days after classes began there, reports of an armed and dangerous suspect on campus and shots fired. It's a scene no student wants to be a part of. This video obtained by our Raleigh station, WTVD. You see the students waiting there inside a locked lecture hall. And late today, officials confirmed that suspect is in custody, but a member of the faculty is dead. Senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami reports. Again in America, this time in North Carolina, police have arrested an accused gunman about a mile away from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Stage for law enforcement, possible active shoot on campus. Where police say the accused gunman shot and killed a university faculty member. Everyone was just panicking. People almost opened the door and they were told not to open the door. And then finally we got evacuated. We'd locked the doors pretty quickly and we were just kind of like hunkering down. Campus alerts went out just after 1 p.m. Eastern, telling students to shelter in place. Authorities quickly released this photo, saying if you see this person, keep your distance, put your safety first, and call 911. The same photo on the school's website says he's a grad student. Our ABC station, WTVD, shares this cell phone video of students taking cover on the floors of lecture halls. Frightened students recorded cell phone videos showing police clearing the building room by room. Parents with kids at a nearby grade school were in a panic. This was their first day of the school year, and the entire school district was locked down for much of the day. My heart is in my mouth. I am waiting for my kid. It was his first day at school today. He's in kindergarten, and this was the last thing that I was kind of hoping to feel on the first day of my kid's school. Have to feel for those parents. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami. Now to new details about the deadly shooting in Jacksonville, Florida. Tonight, the FBI is now investigating this as a hate crime as we get a look at new surveillance video from the Dollar General where a 21-year-old white man killed three black people. And we also hear the desperate 911 call that the shooter's family made to police. ABC's Alex Perche is in Jacksonville with that. Tonight, new details in that racially motivated shooting at a Dollar General that left three black people dead. We have discovered new uh, facts regarding the shooter's movements and whereabouts hours and minutes before he committed his acts of senseless violence at Dollar General. Late today, law enforcement sharing this video they say shows the suspect, 21-year-old Ryan Christopher Palmetter, first entering a family dollar store about a mile away. Not only did the shooter park at the family dollar, he also went inside his store and bought some items. He then stopped at Edward Waters University, a historically black university down the street. This video being used in the investigation, showing the suspect donning a tactical vest and blue latex gloves, students flagging down a security guard. What's going through your mind? That there's something wrong. Um, I was not able to see a weapon at that time. Um, however, I did see what appeared to be a tactical vest, a mask, along with a hat covering his head at that time. Authorities say the suspect hopped a curve and fled, driving to this Dollar General store where he began an 11 minute rampage. Surveillance video shows the shooter without warning, firing 11 rounds into 52 year old Angela Michelle Carr's Kia, killing her. He then walks into the store armed with a handgun and an AR-15 style rifle that authorities say he bought legally. The suspect shooting 19 year old employee AJ Laguerre Jr. Multiple witnesses fleeing out the back of the store and then later, 29-year-old Gerald Galleon enters, the shooter killing him, missing his girlfriend. And 10 minutes into this heinous act, he sends a text. The suspect texts his father and says, use a screwdriver to get into my room. The father enters the room and finds a last will and testament of the suspect along with a suicide note on his laptop. ABC News obtaining this distressed 911 call his father made to police. He left in his car a couple of hours ago. His father stating that his son had been suicidal before and was receiving psychiatric help, but had stopped taking medication. All right, and does your son go anywhere that you know of? Is there like common place no. he goes to? No, he doesn't go anywhere. By that time, the rampage was already over, the shooter taking his own life as officers arrived on the scene. Investigators finding writings on the gunman, which they say contained racist and hateful ideology, as well as painted swastikas on one of the firearms. Plainly put, this shooting was racially motivated, and he hated black people. The FBI opening domestic terror and federal hate crime investigations, saying there's also evidence that the suspect harbored anti-LGBTQ plus and anti-Semitic grievances. The latest federal data shows a 12% increase in hate crime incidents. At a vigil Sunday, Governor Ron DeSantis, who assigned laws to restrict how race is taught in Florida public schools, was booed. We're going to ask the governor here to come down and 
the governor condemning the shooting. We are not going to let people be targeted based on their race. President Biden asked about the shooting just before meeting with Dr. King's family members and other civil rights leaders at the White House. We can't let hate prevail. Tonight, family members of the victims praying that their loved ones spark change. I hope that this really does spark something for people to take a stand. Our thanks to Alex Perchet for that. And also tonight, there's been several developments in the criminal cases against former President Trump. A judge is now set March 4th of next year as the federal trial date on election interference charges. And that is, of course, the day before Super Tuesday. But Trump has already said he will appeal that date. Separately, Trump's former chief of staff and co-defendant in Georgia's election racketeering case, Mark Meadows, took the stand for hours today trying to get that case moved to federal court. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is in Atlanta covering it all for us. Tonight, a federal judge in Washington setting a date for Donald Trump's trial on charges he tried to overturn the 2020 election. March 4th, just one day before Super Tuesday, smack in the middle of the presidential campaign. Special counsel Jack Smith in court for the decision. The former president had asked to push this trial off more than two years to April 2026. His lawyers arguing any sooner would amount to a show trial and a miscarriage of justice. In a heated hearing, they pointed to reams of documents to review and the pressures of the campaign. Judge Tanya Chutkin ordering Trump's lawyers to take the temperature down. Prosecutors argued Trump's own behavior on a near daily basis, including his posts on social media, requires a speedy trial, saying he has publicly disparaged witnesses, he has attacked the integrity of the courts, the citizens of the District of Columbia who make up our jury pool, and this potentially prejudices the jury pool. The judge seeming to agree, saying Mr. Trump, like any defendant, will have to make the trial date work regardless of his schedule. There is a societal interest to a speedy trial. At the same time in Georgia, another key hearing underway. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis charging Trump and 18 others with conspiring to overturn the election in that state. How are you feeling today, Mr. Meadows? Today, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows asking a judge to move his case to federal court where he thinks he can get a more sympathetic jury. Meadows, who has been largely silent for months, taking the stand for more than three hours, insisting... I don't know that I did anything that was outside the scope of my role as chief of staff, including arranging that phone call where Trump pressured Georgia's secretary of state, Brad Raffensperger. Mr. President, everybody is on the line. And just so this is Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. On that call, Trump pushing Raffensperger to find the votes he needed. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Meadows testifying that everything he did was in his capacity as a top White House aide. I saw it as part of my role, he said. The president gave clear direction to deal with it. But prosecutors pushing him. How come he was the only White House official on that call? Why were none of the White House lawyers involved? And late today, Raffensperger himself taking the stand, saying flat out, I thought that it was a campaign call. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky for that report. Next tonight, a rescue helicopter crashed into an apartment complex in Florida, killing two people. And the terrifying moment was caught on camera. But we want to warn you, the video is disturbing. It captures what many people saw from the ground. The Broward Sheriff's Office fire rescue chopper flying with flames and smoke trailing behind and then suddenly breaking apart. One crew member was killed, a captain, as well as one person on the ground. Miraculously, two other crew members survived. Well, the investigation also continues in Australia after three U.S. Marines were killed and several others were injured when an Osprey aircraft crashed during a training exercise with newly obtained air traffic control audio capturing an emergency call from a second U.S. aircraft nearby. Here's ABC's Terry Moran. Tonight, the Department of Defense identifying the three U.S. Marines killed in the fiery crash in Australia. U.S. Marine Corps Corporal Spencer Collard, 21. U.S. Marine Corps Captain Eleanor LeBeau, 29. And U.S. Marine Corps Major Tobin Lewis, 37. Two U.S. Osprey MV-22s were on their way to participate in a major multinational training exercise called Predator's Run Sunday morning when one went down over a remote island off Australia's northern coast, the other radioing in. Guard, uh, we are just declaring an emergency in the vicinity of Melville Island. Roger, search and rescue is on the way. 
Requesting you remain in the area and pass any additional uh, details as they come in, please. Minutes later... Search and rescue is requesting if there's uh, fire. Confirm, uh, there's a significant fire in the vicinity of the crash site. The cause of this crash is still unknown. Investigators are expected to remain at the site for days. Tonight, three Marines remain hospitalized. Those Marines who did survive will be able to help investigators figure out what brought this aircraft down. No doubt the family members of those service members are counting on that. Terry Moran joins us now. So, Terry, we know that this type of aircraft has had a bit of a troubled past. What can you tell us about that? It really has, Trevor. The, all, the Osprey uh, has had a history of deadly crashes and mechanical problems. Over the years, uh, more than a dozen fatal deadly crashes, resulting in more than 50 fatalities uh, in those crashes. And just last year, you may remember, five Marines in an Osprey were killed during a crash uh, in a training exercise outside of San Diego in California. A Marine investigation concluded just last month into that crash that it was caused by mechanical failure. Trevor? Wow. Okay. All right. Terry Moran, thank you. We still have much more to get to coming up. The growing calls for Spanish soccer boss Luis Rubiales to resign after kissing one of his players on the World Cup stage and now the investigation. But next, danger and desperation in Haiti. The dramatic action some residents in Port-au-Prince are now taking to protect themselves from out-of-control gang violence. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Fleeing gang violence, residents in a Port-au-Prince neighborhood abandoned their homes and set up a camp at a local gym. Despite there not being enough tents or food for everyone, displacement victims said returning to their homes was an unlikely option. Gang violence has been on the rise in Haiti with powerful gangs controlling large parts of the country, causing severe food shortages, killings, kidnappings, and widespread sexual violence. Hundreds were evacuated in eastern China after heavy rains triggered flooding and landslides in multiple provinces. Images shared by Chinese media showed emergency personnel evacuating an elderly resident in a wheelchair after floodwaters rose more than three feet high. China has been gripped by weeks of rains and floods amid an unusually wet summer. And Spain's Football Federation has called for their president, Luis Rubiales, to step down. This happens while the nation's high court prosecutor has now opened a preliminary investigation 
investigation into whether Rubiales might have committed an act of sexual aggression when he grabbed player Jenny Hermoso and kissed her on the lips after Spain's victory in the Women's World Cup. Hermoso, her teammates, and the Spanish government say it was unwanted and demeaning. Rubiales' mother has decided to go on a hunger strike inside of a church in support of her son. And joining us now for much more on this and the fallout from it is USA Today columnist and ABC News contributor Christine Brennan. Christine, thanks so much for being here. Trevor, thank you. Of course. What is your reaction to the Spanish Football Federation calling on Rubiales to step down and then the high court opening this investigation? Absolutely. It's about time. It's past time. This has been more than a week, as you know, Trevor. The uh, Spanish team won the World Cup Sunday morning. And here it is Monday evening, uh, a full eight days later, almost nine days later. And the idea that this man felt that he could get away with kissing, forcibly kissing, uh, some might even call it sexual assault, uh, of a player who is obviously the star, one of the stars of the Spanish team, Jenny Hermoso, the greatest scorer, goal scorer in the history of Spanish women's soccer. And the Spanish government has been saying from the get-go how terrible this is. While the, the, the Football Federation has been cheering him, there was the, the scenes of him saying he wasn't going to resign. Back right after it happened, Trevor, the uh, Minister of Equality in Spain said that this was a form of sexual violence. She said that within hours after it happened in Australia. So so the government has been strong on this from the from the beginning. Obviously, the, the Football Federation is now on board, and he is already suspended for three months by FIFA, the worldwide soccer governing body. We did also, Christine, I know, finally hear from Spain's coach, uh, Jorge Vilda. He called it improper behavior. Of course, Vilda himself has had 15 complaints against him going back before the World Cup. What happened with those? Yeah, they were coaching technique questions, um, uh, mental, emotional abuse, uh, the players alleged. There were 15 players. The, these were 15 of the best players in Spain. In other words, they, they were on the national team. And they all wrote letters, personal letters, to the Federation, which of course <laughs> means Luis Rubiales, of all people, back in late September last year. So we're almost at the year mark for that. And they complained. They said they needed changes. They needed changes in the coaching staff. It was emotional. It was a concern about health, concern about injuries, pretty much everything across the board that they were worried that Vilda was not uh, doing his job properly and that they were being targeted by him. Instead of listening to the players, the Spanish Federation went with Vilda 100 percent and told all 15 players they were no longer on the team. And um, that, and they only brought three of them back. Twelve never made it to the World Cup, which is pretty sad when you think about it. Only three made it on the World Cup team, the 23-woman World Cup team. It is all highlighting a much broader conversation, Christine, that clearly you've been beating the drum on for quite some time about what particularly female athletes have had to endure, coaches abusing their power. Given what we're seeing and how obviously there's a lot of attention on this, but clearly there's much more that was left behind. Is the world getting any better at preventing this types of things? Is there any reason to think that there's going to be actual institutional change here? Trevor, it's a, it's a great question. Like, is this a reckoning? Is this that mm -hmm. watershed moment that we've been waiting for? You know, we, we would have thought these things might have happened sooner around the world. But as one of the government officials in Spain said this week, this is their Me Too mo movement. This is their Me Too moment. And this is something that apparently happens in countries at different times. Uh, the machismo, the misogyny, the sexism of the Spanish Football Federation, there it is on display for all to see, the felt that, uh, that Rubiales felt so comfortable doing that in public. What in the world's going on behind the scenes uh, in that federation? Well, now the world sees it. And what we have seen uh, pretty much around the, around the world and across the board is support for Jenny Hermoso and support for the women and anger at Rubiales. And that is a huge step forward. And Christine, before I let you go, I just want to make a point uh, to end this segment, if we can, talking about Jenny Hermoso. I mean, we want to make sure that she's not just the woman who was kissed against her will. She's a World Cup champion. She's a legend in Spanish soccer. She's not what happened to her. Can you just talk a little bit about the kind of player she is and the kind of leader that she is? That's such a good point, Trevor. Absolutely. 33 years old the greatest goal scorer in the history of Spain. She's five foot nine, which is pretty tall in soccer, which makes her a great target 
uh, in front of the goal and set pieces and what have you. And she is uh, the leader of Spain in so many ways. And so a great career, not just a good career, but a legendary career, which is why the world is, is all the soccer players around the world are, are wearing our wristbands saying that they're with her. They support her because she's such a popular figure and she's such an excellent soccer player. And yes, I agree with you that it's much more than that kiss. This is a woman of substance, a great athlete, a great person. And actually, I think she's going to end up doing even better things moving forward. Certainly, people looking forward to what she's going to do, but they're also looking forward to much more from her on the pitch. Christine Brennan, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure, Trevor. Thank you. And we still have much more here on Prime, including when you wish upon a star, dozens of wishes come true at the most magical place on Earth. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We turn now to a magical milestone for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. It officially marked the 150,000th wish granted at Walt Disney World. Our Gio Benitez has the story. Hear ye, hear ye. Welcome one and all to the Royal Ball. It's a royal extravaganza. Disney and the Make-A-Wish Foundation hosting the Once Upon a Wish Party for over 50 wish kids receiving the royal treatment. In attendance, 17-year-old Michaela, who battles cancer, whose wish is to sing a Disney princess anthem at the royal ball. Michaela taking part in one-on-one -on -one coaching and behind-the-scenes primping from some of Disney's top experts. Hitting high notes in the recording studio. That's awesome. And picking out a gown for the gala. The 50 Wish Kids joining Michaela for the Once Upon a Wish Party. You're all royalty for the day. I'm so proud of the relationship that we've had with Make a Wish for almost 40 years now. Families come to forget about the world around them and dream and create memories. All building up to the crowning event, the Royal Ball. definitely came true. I feel like a Disney princess. That's a great story. Our thanks to Gio for that. We do want to mention Disney is the parent company of ABC News. That's our show for tonight. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com.